Our closing speaker needs no introduction. Please welcome Dr. David Suzuki, scientist, environmental activist, broadcaster, father, grandfather, and our own Suzuki Elf. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to the Council of Elders for all the work you've done to bring this together and, and, and for pulling it off. And thank all of you for, for coming and uh, spending your day uh, with us here. I'm so delighted that Terry O'Reilly took time out to come and uh, share his ideas with you. He spent almost all day yesterday with the Foundation staff and really energized us with a lot of uh, ideas. And I'm sure that his uh, presentation this morning really sparked a lot of things for you to talk about uh, today. It certainly has for me. I've thrown together, I, I had a speech I wrote yesterday, then I kind of modified it this morning, and now I've kind of added and thrown out stuff, so I've got a bit of a dog's breakfast to <laughs> present to you. I, uh, I, I want to start with some background that I bought half of you, I'm sure, have heard from me before. And that is that when Tar and I began spending more and more time with First Nations people, and that was some 35 years ago, one of the things that struck us so profoundly was the, the role of elders in communities. And we went into some pretty tough communities that were really uh, dealing with issues of poverty and, and uh, drug abuse, and, and um, still the role of the elders was central. You go to a, well, you watch young leaders of groups when they're negotiating with politicians or with uh, companies, and very often they'll say, oh, I, I can't answer that, I've got to go and talk to, to the elders, or uh, I have to seek the advice of my elders on that one. You realize that elders are playing an absolutely critical role in the uh, way that these various communities are going. And when you go to a feast or a potlatch, and an elder walks in. I mean, they're like rock stars. I would love to be treated like that. I mean, the young kids run up and take their arms and they get the best seats in the house. They always get to open the event with a prayer. They're always given the food first and they always are asked to close the sessions. I mean, this is more than just a ceremonial thing. They play a critical uh, role in these communities because they are valued because they're the repository of experience, of knowledge, of stories of, uh, from their elders. Basically, in short, they are the heart and soul of each culture. And it's such a contrast with the society that we live in. We are kind of seen as impediments, you know. The sooner we get out of the way, the better, you know. Or they don't know how to use an ATM, or they don't know how to use voicemail, or whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, the, even the way that we're portrayed in the media, you know, oh, there's a, a coming wave of, of these old people and the cost of the, 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 medical, uh, the medical establishment and all of the, who's going to pay for us? We're uh, uh, seen as a big drain on society. We are living in a society that is changing today explosively. Just think of today's mores on sex, on marriage and divorce, birth control, abortion, you think of the things that have come in with computers and television, the depiction of violence in every media, Walmarts and Home Depot, I mean there's just a flood of things that have changed society beyond anything I knew when I was a child. And we've become a very, we're a very adaptable creature. I mean ad adaptability was the secret to our success as we moved out of Africa 150,000 years ago, as we moved across the planet, we were a very adaptable creature because our intelligence enabled us to adapt and to see opportunities and resources in completely new areas. So we were able to adapt and live in steaming jungles, in, in uh, tropical rainforests, on prairies, on mountaintops, in wetlands, uh, in deserts, and in the Arctic tundra, human beings have adapted to each of these radically different uh, ecosystems, and, and that's a tribute to our, our intelligence and ability to, uh, to change to suit the, uh, the circumstances. But I believe that 
one problem is that we are so adaptable that, and without the reference points that adults, our elders give us, we then lose sight of where we've come from or where we seem uh, to be going. I remember there was a, an empty lot uh, in our neighborhood and the kids, there were a number of trees in it, the kids used to go and play and they could dig around the rocks. And then after years like that, one day we went by and the trees were all cut down. A week later there was a big hole in the ground and a few weeks after that you could begin to see a big building was going up and within, by the end of the year, uh, there was a brand new apartment building, it was fully occupied. None of the people living in that apartment building had any idea that there was once a, a grove of trees on that lot. And we who lived in the neighborhood very quickly adapted to the apartment being there and we forget what was there. And that's what's happening uh, all over the world and, and in, uh, in Canada especially. I was born in Vancouver in 1936. And I can remember uh, in my very early years, Dad would uh, take me up to the Vetter River and, and we would uh, take a horse and, and we'd go up the Vetter River and fish for, uh, for steelhead. Uh, we uh, would take a boat right off Spanish banks and catch halibut. Or we could go down to the, to the, uh, uh, to the Fraser River any time and catch sturgeon. I mean, it, today, people don't know that once uh, was the way uh, life existed. I, we were, uh, I lived in uh, Marple, and I, the first Christmas I remember, Dad just took a sleigh, and we went, I don't know, somewhere in the city and cut down a Christmas tree. I mean, it was mainly forest in Marple at that time. And I would fish for a trout in some creek right in Marple, which is, no longer exists. So many things that have been uh, lost, I mean, there was, used to be a Vancouver Sun Salmon Derby. I'm sure most of you remember that. And there would be hundreds of thousands of dollars of prizes, boats and motors, and you could get the salmon right out here. Well, it was canceled, what, over 20 years ago. Why? There are no salmon left. But, so my children have no idea that there was once a, a Vancouver Sun Salmon Derby. It's been called the price of progress. And I think we're at a time now when we have to begin to define progress in a different way. Americans would say, oh, well, we cut down those trees, you know, there's plenty more where that came from. Well, maybe when 150,000 years ago when we were in Africa, there was plenty more. But we know very well that we've occupied every continent on the planet, and there isn't plenty more. If they're not here, the chances are they're not anywhere. I just got a report from the foundation saying that they're... I don't know if you know the sage grouse, which is a spectacular animal. And they have this whole courting display that's quite amazing. There are estimated to be 14 left in the province of Alberta and 20-something in Saskatchewan. And uh, so they're right on the brink. Uh, within a couple of years, that species is going to wink out. In British Columbia, we have, I don't know what the number is, maybe someone in the foundation can tell me, 12? Spotted owls left, 12 spotted owls left. We know that they have an absolute requirement for old growth rainforest, and our government, knowing that they are going to disappear within years, refuses to save enough old growth forest for the spotted owl. And that's happening uh, all over the place. It's the price of progress. We, uh, Tara and I have a wonderful place on uh, Quadra Island. She doesn't like me to say the name because she thinks you're going to all come and try to visit us. <laughs> but uh, we, we love to go there and, and we, we have to take the ferry to Vancouver Island, drive up to Campbell River, and then the last ferry is only about 20 minutes, 20 minute ride. But on that ferry, we often see eagles and herring balls and salmon. And we go, oh, God, it's so great to be back in nature where, you know, where everything's okay. Until I talk to an elder on the island, our neighbor, Dan Leclerc. And Dan has uh, lived in that area for over 60 years. And he tells me when he was a child that uh, he would go out in a rowboat, a little punt with a rake, and he could rake herring off the, off the seaweed and fill his punt with, with herring in a matter of minutes. They had one opening for a commercial herring fishery that wiped out all of the herring in that area and they've never come back. 
We, um, he said that they could go out any time and just and get a, a red snapper or, or a lingcod uh, for dinner. Well, the, there's no allowing a lingcod uh, to be fished in that area now because they are so endangered. There are no red snappers left. And we used to, when we got the place, we used to go and get rock cod all the time for breakfast. But uh, when the government says you can only take one rock cod a day, you know we shouldn't be catching any at all. We, um, the problem is, and Dan will tell us that he used to hear the salmon coming for the creek near our place because there were so many, they'd be sl slapping on the water as they jumped on their way to the, the river. Well, just isn't that kind of uh, run in that area at all. So what our elder on Quadra tells us is that because we live in a city which is already a radically impoverished, biologically impoverished area, to us, Quadra seems rich and na natural and abundant but it's only when you talk to an elder, you realize that what we're left with is, is a mere shadow of what once was. And here is where elders are so critically important, because as Daniel Pauly at UBC says, we're constantly shifting the baseline. If we don't remember what it once was, then we have a very shallow memory of, uh, of what we want to try to restore. For example, as you well know, there's this miracle that happened in the Fraser River. The largest sockeye salmon run in the world is in the Fraser River. Now, for years, a, a run of 30, 25, 30 million sockeye was considered a very, very good run. It had diminished down to one million two years ago. And I said to Tara, well, that's it, they've had it. You know, there, there's no... And as you know, a year later, we got the biggest run in 100 years, over 30 million fish, which is a cause for celebration, but when you look at the historical record before the arrival of Europeans, First Nations along the Fraser River lived on about 140 million sockeye. So our, our baseline has been shifted to the last 100 years when it seemed that 30 million was a, a large run. If we're going to try to restore the earth, to reverse this destructive trend and restore the productivity of the earth. We need to know what the baseline is that we're aiming at. And elders can remember the stories from their elders, and so again, push us back uh, further in our memory. I, uh, I still have a hard time thinking of myself as an elder, but I'm so old. I can remember the world in which we, I drank out of any river or lake without a second thought. And I've, I've been shocked going on, on canoe trips when people say, and we're way the hell out in the wilderness, and, and still the young kids say, is it okay to drink this water? Like that's the way it should be, and that's the way it was until very recently. The oceans were rich beyond imagination compared to what we know today. Forests covered most of the planet when I was a young boy. And when I was a boy, there was no such thing as organic food because all food was grown without the chemical input uh, that is put on it today. Of course, there have been enormous advances in my lifetime. I remember a, a killer fog in Vancouver when I was going to kindergarten, and it was so dense that you couldn't see from one house to the next, and that's because we burned coal back then, and coal's been uh, eliminated pretty well. I remember when, uh, I, I remember when, well, I don't remember, but I remember my parents telling me. I was a twin, and when I was born, there were complications. I was the first one out, uh, weighed over nine pounds, and my sister was the second out. She weighed less than three. So that's me in a hog. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there were complications with my sister, and my parents couldn't afford it. They had to go into debt for years to pay for uh, the, the, the hospitalization of my sister. I, uh, all these are, the, the uh, advances are all the more reason, I believe, for elders to speak out and remind us of what once was and where we are today. Canada boasts of being a democracy, a democracy that guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of movement, and equality before the law. It's a noble ideal. My mother and father 
were born in Vancouver, my dad in 1909, my mother in 1911. They couldn't vote because they were Japanese Canadians. They became adults when the stock market crashed in 1929. And they survived the Great Depression. And because of that terrible time, which was scarred into their lives, they brought us up very strongly drummed into our heads certain things that they felt were important. They always said, live within your means. Save some for tomorrow. Share. Don't be greedy. Help your neighbor. You never know when you might need his help. Be kind to those that are down and out because you may run into a string of bad luck just like them. Work hard to earn the money you need for, to, for what you need. You don't earn money to buy what you want, it's what you need. And we were taught to pity the person that ran around flaunting their fancy clothes or cars be, as if they were somehow better or more important people than we were. Those values seem so quaint today, and yet I can't imagine them having a greater importance uh, among our young people today. My parents were Canadian born and raised. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, our world ended as we knew it. Under the War Measures Act, we were deprived of all rights of citizenship. We, were, we lost our property, our bank accounts were frozen, and we were shipped to camps in the Rocky Mountains for the duration of the war. As the war was coming to an end, we were faced, we were given two options. Sign up and renounce your citizenship and get a one-way ticket to Japan, or get out of British Columbia and go east of the Rockies. My mother's parents, of course, were born in Japan. They were disgusted with the way Canada treated them and said, we're getting out of this country. They were dropped off in Hiroshima and were both dead in less than a year. We were, my dad said, Japan's a foreign country, we're staying here. We ended up in southern Ontario in a town called Leamington, home of Heinz Ketchup. When we arrived in Leamington, we were told the great boast of Leamington was no colored person has stayed in Leamington beyond sunset. Mm -hmm. We were the first colored family to move into Leamington. The point here is not to make you feel guilty or, or to pity, feel pity, but to say that democracy is not easy. You can say the words about democracy, but it's very, very hard to make democracy a fact. You see, you can guarantee all kinds of things when times are good. Oh yeah, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, you're equal before the law. That's easy when times are good. The only time those guarantees matter is when times are tough. And if you can't guarantee it when times are tough, then we don't deserve to call ourselves a democracy. Canada failed fundamentally in 1942 when the War Measures Act was placed on Japanese Canadians. Canada failed in October of 1970 when Trudeau imposed the War Measures Act to deal with the FLQ, and Canada to this day is failing in the way that we are treating the First Nations of this country. We never get enough democracy. We always have to work hard to get more of it. My parents got the vote for the first time after World War II, so I was brought up again believing that the right to vote was one of the most precious privileges that you could have. So I've been absolutely diligent about voting, especially in the federal elections. I've voted in every single federal election since I turned 21. And guess what? I have never voted for a party that got into office. <laughs> so my vote essentially has been thrown away all these years because we are one of the last of the so-called democratic countries that still clings to this this uh, flawed system of first past the post. So we've got to have reform in this to get proportional representation so th those of us that are voting for uh, some of these 
other fringe parties <laughs> may ultimately be counted. We, um, they say that 55 to 60 percent voted in the last federal election. And of that 55 to 60 percent that voted, 40 percent voted for a party that got into power with a majority. Something does not compute here. We get a minority of a minority that is electing government to office. In the most recent election in Ontario, 49% voted. In Vancouver, we think, oh, we got a good turnout. 34% voted. And you know that most of the money today for candidates comes from corporations or rich people. So when someone is elected, then since whoever pays the piper calls the tunes, corporations and the rich have direct access. I remember when we were battling over forests in British Columbia, and it took us weeks to get an appointment with the Minister of Forests. We, we sat there outside, he made us wait and wait, finally got to see him for half an hour, and as soon as we came out, there was a lineup of forest company executives all waiting to walk in, and, hi, Jack, how are you? And uh, you could see where the real influence lies. Those that pay the piper calls the tune. Call the tune, and as, as I've said over and over, money talks. So, when someone is elected, the, we see that those that have supported the election to the greatest extent get uh, a place in that person's ear. But corporations are not people. I know that the law says corporations are people. Last time I looked, I have never seen a corporation you could shoot and kill. We, uh, corporations, are not people. Why then do we, after an election, why are we told that we have to sacrifice social services, the safety nets, to serve the corporate needs in the coming years? It makes no sense to me, except whoever pays the piper calls the tune. We need to stop corporate and individual funding of political candidates. Another thing that happens is that because it's now so expensive to run for office, you find a disproportionate representation of political candidates come from two areas. They come from business or they come from law. Now I happen to think that's because they are people who are among those who can afford to run and lose. A lot of us would be very nervous about running for office and incurring the debts and, and losing. Uh, an election. So when you look at our, our uh, um, government, the, the cabinet, we did a study many years ago, I'm sure it's not much different. 70% of the cabinet members uh, back uh, in the 1970s came from business or law. And so it skews government priorities when that happens. They're obsessed with issues jurisdictional or economic. So we need much broader uh, spectrum of people to represent us and lead us into the future. I really believe we should not have any campaign financing except from the taxpayer. In other words, for those people who are qualified, and we can set rigid qualification standards for those who run for office and have sufficient support to merit it, that we ought to pay through our tax dollars, and that will cap how much is spent on campaigns. It's obscene that in the United States, Obama spent over a billion dollars, as did Hillary. To, well, no, I guess not Hillary. She didn't run for the final run. But he spent over a billion dollars to run for office. That's crazy. And we, uh, as you know, our, our uh, budget for, for campaigns is rising all the time. That's got to stop. There's got to be a limit to it. But we need people who are elected who represent us. And they will if we pay for their campaigns. Elders have a very special role to play in the dominant society we live in as much as in First Nations communities. We are the repository of experience, of observations, and thought. And I believe that we have a special credibility because we're really freed from the kinds of distraction and pressures of those when we were younger who run for uh, power or fame or money or even sex. I mean, these are things that muddle your brain and get you off doing all kinds of 
weird things. As an elder, you're, you've sloughed off all of those kinds of pressures. And I believe that we can now speak and no one can accuse us of having a hidden agenda. Too much these days there, there's in the cacophony of voices coming at us from every angle. Uh, we never ask, what's the agenda of that person? These deniers of climate change, these blog sites that say climate change is junk science, if you track the money, you find very clearly what the hidden agenda is uh, from these people in these blog sites. I, I believe that elders no longer can be accused of that because we've, we've moved away from that. Testosterone levels have dropped and we're free. You know, suddenly I got really smart as my testosterone <laughs> that was dropped. I was really stupid when I was younger. So, um, well, I've been, uh, Tara and I have been long involved in the peace movement and one of the most powerful groups in the States was a re retired admirals and generals against nuclear war. These are folks that had gone through the system, they'd had to say the right things because they were part of the system, but once they were, were, had retired, they were freed to say the truth, to speak the truth. And it was a very, very powerful voice. I think we ought to have a graze for green. We ought to have retired CEOs and company presidents for a sustainable future. Because as we are freed of those kinds of responsibilities and pressures, we can speak the truth. The recent Occupy movement, I hope, outside of, uh, of Wall Street, I hope it's not dead. And uh, if you've been down to the Occupy uh, camps, now I know it's not there now, but predominantly young people. Democracy is very tough. And for weeks they have floundered around trying to figure out what the hell are we here for and trying to focus and I think their fundamental problem is that they are trying to be different in having no leaders. And I'm afraid that's doomed to failure in the world that we live in. Sooner or later, they're going to find certain individuals are most articulate or charismatic and understand the issues and can present it. And that's going to have to happen. But I think that it's clear, when, at least from my, um, from my visits to the Occupy movement in Vancouver and Montreal, they also need, they desperately need, the helping hand of elders. Elders who can provide the insights, can provide, uh, well, demonstrate what uh, options are possible. Tell them what the roots are that they're, the Occupy movement is coming from. So I, I believe that when you reach the state of elderhood, it's not a time to put your feet up and plan your next golf game or, or uh, playing bridge all night, I think that it's time to get on with the most important phase of our lives. We have an enormous responsibility. We were the ones that lived as we did and are now, we are the ones leaving our kids the world and we know that it's not the world we received from our elders. Seems to me there's a huge responsibility there. And that, I believe, is to provide the, the knowledge that we have to help the muscle of youth. Youth have everything at stake. It's their future. And I think that we should be a part of uh, the process of helping them work their way into that future that we're leaving for them. Thank you very much.